Good afternoon, colleagues. I haven't seen you for a while. So I have really missed you. Uh, why we're here is obvious. The session for the defense of thesis by Suyaza Vyacheslav Lerich. The theme you can see here, the disciplinary court of Imperial St. Petersburg and Moscow universities, 1902-1917. The chairman of the council is me, by the order, and the members of our council, Dorska, Alexandra Nina, he, she's here, Lonska, Svetlana Vladimirna is also here, Timoshina, Yelena Vladimirna, you can see her over here, and our colleague from Ukraine, Stov Alexey Vyacheslavich, you can also see him here. So. We can start. And the degree applicant is here, of course. You can see him. His academic advisor, Andrei Vitalovich Ilyin, is also here. Uh, we are complete. Uh, following the instructions, I have to inform you that the thesis, the thesis was written on the basis of our university number of publications and uh, documents have been submitted and so basically that is it that is all uh, now uh, I have to give the floor to Vyacheslav I would like to give the floor to Vyacheslav Valerievich you have 15 minutes uh, dear Igor Yurevich dear council members dear colleagues uh, th this is presented to your attention is connected with the legal nature of professors disciplinary courts in two capital imperial universities uh, St. Petersburg and Moscow due to modern technology the full text of the work is available on the website of St. Petersburg University so let me briefly touch upon the key points at the current stage of education law development studies related with autonomous regulation of relations at the university environment are particularly promising, and students, along with university professors, scientists, and managers, are the most numerous and mobile part of the academic community. At present, Russian universities, there are no bodies similar to professors' disciplinary courts, although for at least over half, one and a half centuries there's been an inevitable complication in the structure of academic corporations and the structure and content of uh, legal relations. This sets the task of finding the optimal ways to resolve the legal inevitable conflict situations at the university cooperation, first of all between the students on the one hand and between students and professors on the other. One of the aspects of relevance of the present work is exactly the possibility to study the experience of bringing students to disciplinary responsibility in the beginning of the 20th century to assess its potential in the modern conditions, which, however, is not the task of historian laws, but specialists in the current educational law. The conducted study has considerable scientific novelty as by now this topic has not been practically studied and the available scientific articles only indirectly touch upon the theme of my research. In addition, most of the sources are documents from the funds of five archives in St. Petersburg and Moscow which were first introduced into scientific circulation. The purpose of the study was to identify the regulatory and legal grounds and the main activities of professors disciplinary courts during the entire period of their existence between 1902 to 1917 at the Imperial St. Petersburg, Petrograd, and Moscow universities. As a result, the following main conclusions were drawn. First, the function of resolving the legal conflicts in the societies before, can be formed both by courts and quasi-traditional bodies. If justice interpreted broadly as activities aimed at fair resolution of legal conflicts, for the purpose of restoring violated rights, it can be extended to the activities of the quasi-traditional bodies. In this case, justice is specific, applicable to individuals, not to the legal order as a whole. In this case, activity of quasi-traditional bodies does not personify the uh, state as a system of, man of management bodies of this society, and the, but the state organized society as a whole. The Professor's disciplinary court has mixed legal status. 
It was not part of the system of state courts, but administered justice in its broad sense. Members of the professor's disciplinary court were not granted a set of judicial uh, guarantees or privileges, but only received additional functions along with the status of a university professor. It was established in a higher education institution of the Ministry of Public Education as a closed corporation whose members were members of the academic community. The only task of such a court was to process the disciplinary offenses of students and penalties applied to them were related exclusively to the status of a student. Next, when developing the provisional rules of professional disciplinary courts on the 24th of August 1902, the initiators of the reform pursued the following goals to re regulate the legal relations in higher education. First, organization and legal, to relieve the administration of higher education institutions which could not properly deal with cases of student misconduct due to many other functions. Second, justice and legal aid, creation of a specialized body whose sole purpose was to hear cases of student misconduct which provided students with a certain set of procedural safeguards and confidence that a court decision would be fair to them. Judges were elected professors who had considerable authority within the academic community, which increased the confidence of students in the decisions of the court. Political propedeutics, establishment of professors' disciplinary to students, and the liberal part of the profession. Uh, prof and became an important element in transition to methods of indirect uh, on the situation student community. At the same time, the imperial bureaucracy actually entrusted the faculty of universities with the function of control over students, using their status as educators who have a significant influence on the minds of the young people. The professor's disciplinary court was not a punitive institution established to curb the political activity of the students. On the contrary, it was established as, uh, to uh, restore certain elements of university autonomy uh, which was lost after the adoption of the University Charter in 1884. At present, the Russian legal system does not provide for institutions bodies similar to professors' disciplinary court. At the same time, there are other institutions with the authority to decide the issue of disciplinary liability of students of higher educational institutions. In the aggregate, they provide a sufficient set of guarantees for students facing disciplinary liability. Thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to ask questions. Dear colleagues, do you have any questions? You so quiet today. So no one has any questions. Thank you. Uh, then let us move on. And I think uh, we should shall start with those far away from us. What do you think? Uh, Alexey Vyacheslavich is uh, really far away from us. Are you ready to speak, Alexey Vyacheslavich? Yes, I am ready to speak. Okay, then the floor is yours. Okay. So we are. So I have to present my review now. Yes, yeah, that's correct. Thank you, I got you. Dear colleagues, I'm glad to welcome you. Unfortunately, I cannot visit the session in person, but I think that's not the last session of this kind, and in the future we shall meet. We, without the help of the modern technology. And uh, speaking of the thesis in question by Vyacheslav Alerevich, the full text of my review has been published at the university website. That is why I will uh, only briefly outline the key points of the thesis, which seem interesting to me. 
first of all uh, what draws attention and deserves praise is the differentiation of justice and legal procedures is no secret that in our technology in, in information intense sphere there are some bad tendencies such as turning activities of judicial bodies into technical or digital activity which is similar to uh, produ uh, automatic production of legal decisions, court decisions, uh, without void of value component, which includes justice, of course. And in this sense, the uh, author just quite rightly says that it is necessary to differentiate legal proceedings and justice because such a key thing as justice, we cannot talk uh, without it. But quasi-judicial bodies or other bodies related to courts and justice. And further, this differentiation made by the author of justice and court procedures is, is a theoretical and methodological bridge to differentiation of legal and quasi-judicial bodies. This is also a very good point of the strong point of the thesis because Professor's Disciplinary Court balances on the edge as a judicial body and on the other hand an educational institution, a public institution and then for that time a border of uh, tw early 20th century. That, as the author emphasizes, was a novelty when in such uh, academic sphere after all the moves of Alexander III that contradicted the liberal moves of the uh, uni of universities as institutions, the transformation started and university were given some degree of autonomy. What else? In the thesis, what deserves praise in the thesis and attention, of course, is the comparative study of activities of professors' disciplinary courts and the modern bodies, regulatory acts, uh, and uh, proceedings uh, at higher insti educational institutions. This adds relevance uh, to the study and uh, definitely increases its theoretical and practical significance. As I would like to focus on the structure and language of the thesis, as I have already said in my review, it's very clear, coherent. The work is logically divided into three chapters. The first chapter is dedicated to the legal nature of Professor's Disciplinary Court, and I have already touched upon this. Next, the author in the chapter two tells the history of Professor's Disciplinary Court, and the chapter three is dedicated to uh, examination of activities of these institutions. Thus, to finish the positive part of my review, the thesis is certainly well written, has quite of high quality and interesting. But as we know, advantages of uh, every phenomenon are continuations of its drawback, and drawbacks are continuation of uh, advantages. So I beg your pardon for this paradox, but my comments by negative the negative part of my review will be very similar to the points I have just praised and when differentiating uh, justice and legal procedures uh, we should mention that the author 
different differentiates between on the basis of formula Rablach and the teachings of a distinguished lawyer Petrajitsky, Lev Petrajitsky. Here, what uh, what is bad here? So what's wrong here? So the teachings of Petrajitsky is taken as a theoretical basis of the study pragmatically without any analysis of its advantages and disadvantages. This point, this dogmaticism could be avoided by uh, system by systematical study of Trajitsky uh, views on the nature of justice. But uh, this study into history of justice is a quite uh, a systematic approach to justice is connected so uses def the definition dictionaries legal dictionaries then jumps to into the modern times Russo and Savinese opinions and then to constitutions of different countries in a similar manner he analyzes justice it starts by analyzing Raproch formula uh, making reference to Andrei uh, Polyakov and then uh, chronologically uh, jumps back and looks at the views of uh, Aristotle and then without any transition jumps back to modern time and analyzes the views of the modern Russian researchers Alexis Narcissian and others and other researchers of course here we should uh, say that the thesis is aimed at analysis of history of s law and state but following the chronological principle in presentation of the theoretical basis of the study in my opinion would increase the level of scientific reliability of the study also i'd like to focus on some other points uh, which in my opinion in my subjective opinion uh, some uh, formal contradictions so first of all the author of the th of the thesis mentions that uh, activity can be to justice on page 31 of the of the thesis but earlier on page 20 the author claims that the activity of legal bodies is not just cannot be described as justice so then what is the activity of quasi judicial bodies is it justice or not justice or quasi justice quasi just uh, just activities justice activities i'm not uh, trying to be funny here this uh definition apparatus of course the author uh, clarifies quite correctly the, uh, legal conflicts the resolution of legal conflicts I think we have a technical issue. Let's call it a uh, technical break. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear? Yes, I can hear you. So we can also hear you. OK. I apologize uh, for this. Uh, where did you stop hearing me? Okay. And finally, uh, my lo final comment is a, is a purely technical inaccuracy that according to Annex 12 of the study, Petrozhitsky uh, s uh, mentioned as the only candidate for professor's disciplinary court on page 173, while on page 128 there is evidence that in 19, 
1912, Petrozhitsky was elected not as candidate but a judge of the professor's disciplinary court of St. Petersburg Imperial University. Yet those uh, draw, uh, those comments, those drawbacks. Again, the sound is gone. Okay, now we can hear you. You can continue. Please continue. We can hear you. Okay. As, as uh, to sum it up, I'd like to say that a thesis by Suyazov, Vyacheslav Alirovich, uh, is certain, certainly deserves awarding the degree corresponds to all the r requirements set by the local regulations and as an informal conclusion by way of informal conclusion i'd like to say that this is a very good thesis i read it uh, in one go it was very interesting a serious historical research and some minor theoretical drawbacks uh, uh, don't have no impact on the value or the contribution of the author. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alexey Vyacheslavich, for your interesting review and for following the time frame. Uh, Vyacheslav Alirovich, will you answer all reviews at once? Yes, uh, I'd prefer to answer all the reviews. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yelena Vladimirovna. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I would start by saying that the thesis by Vyacheslav Alirovich is uh, a no has certain novelty. Um, uh, this uh, is because of the theme and uh, of the, because of presentation of the theme in the thesis. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that on the one hand, the thesis is written on the history of law, used unique archive materials of five archives. And on the basis of these archive materials, uh, two chapters uh, of the thesis out of three have been written. And the work contains many interesting historical details, which uh, due to this, the study of Vyacheslav Valerievich uh, uh, become became part of history of our university and of the Moscow University, and also uh, sh I should mention that Vyacheslav Valerievich uses uh, archives uh, systematically studies all the. Uh, Collect the complete collection of protocols or discipline records of the two universities. And here I'd like to draw attention that very often studies are written uh, in descriptive manner and uh, they describe legal acts for a certain period. And the work of Vyacheslav Valerievich considers not only the legal basis for activities of the disciplinary court, but on the basis of the archive materials, the activity itself of the courts, so the uh, law as it functioned. That's on the one hand, that's like on the one side, so set of advantages uh, of the thesis. But, and on the uh, uh, other hand, and Alexey Vyacheslavich paid attention, the yes, theoretical aspect, and the author tries to identify the nature of such corporate institutions, uh, judicial functions. And in my opinion, in this sense, the thesis provides valuable empirical material as a study of such type of uh, uh, the study of corporate law, uh, university, inside university cooperation, and of course, the uh, problems of the nat nature of justice could be as the subject of a s separate study. 
And here, the theoretical introduction in chapter one provides tools for further analysis of the historical material, and that is very, very important. And the very issue of legal nature of university disciplinary courts is very interesting. And if the author maybe failed in some places, the very issue itself is very new. Another interesting aspect of the study is that Vyacheslav Valerievich um, builds bridges with the modern time into the modern times to compare the modern legal practice in the sphere of educational law. And in this sense, we may talk, I may say that the work fills the gap in the history of institutional aspects of the university autonomy. And in this sense, Vyacheslav Valerievich uh, has written a new page in the history of the university autonomy and uh, autonomy of St. Petersburg and Moscow universities, first of all. So that briefly, these briefly are, in my opinion, the most significant points of the thesis by Vyacheslav Valerievich, which uh, do not leave uh, any other possibilities but to say that this thesis corresponds to all the applicable requirements. And uh, I have very few comments, maybe questions, to Vyacheslav Valerievich. Uh, the author many times mentions that in St. Petersburg, uh, the attitude to uh, the professor's disciplinary court, the attitude was negative. Uh, from uh, the side of professors and students. The author cites statement, Professor Zizilenka, as a disciplinary court, the institution is absolutely unsatisfactory that cannot perform its tasks, uh, which can be vested on an institution of this type. And uh, a similar statement, Professor Steklov, that a, a disciplinary court can do nothing but harm. Uh, and Vyacheslav Valerievich also says that in both universities, the disciplinary courts stopped functioning before they were officially uh, uh, banished. And uh, because of that, I have a number of questions. My first question is why uh, such neg a negative attitude uh, in both universities. And my second question is where, according to the author, were the possible drawbacks of its setup or maybe of their performance of the courts? The third question is what is the reason their activities, the courts stopped operations both in Moscow and St. Petersburg universities. And finally, my uh, final question is, uh, considering the negative attitude towards disciplinary court uh, from the side of the students and professors, considering that disciplinary courts stopped operations before they were officially uh, abolished, uh, what is, where is the positive experience of uh, resolving conflicts in the in universities which could be used in uh, modern legal regulations of conflicts? So these are uh, questions uh, I would like to ask out of curiosity. Uh, and in this respect, I absolutely agree with Alexei Vyacheslavich that the, the work is uh, very interesting. And uh, uh, you can read it in one go. And what the author has accomplished leaves 
me with no doubt that this thesis corresponds to all the requirements and Vyacheslav Valery deserves to be awarded the degree of candidate of uh, legal sciences. Thank you. Thank you, Yelena Vladimirovna. Now, uh, I'd like to give the floor to those present. Let's start uh, on my right. Dear Chairman, dear colleagues, I would like to draw your attention to uh, the main multiple aspects of this of the study in question because it makes a significant contribution to the history uh, to the into the study of Russian uh, judicial system in the broadest sense because the author is talking about quasi judicial bodies and in the history of law in the sphere of education and in uh, here the author succeeded in both cases. Uh, the historical material in the thesis is uh, co uh, agrees very well the, with the general historical context. For example, uh, using the University Charter of 1884, which shows that on the one hand, it was always seen as a reactionary, uh, as reactionary as compared to the earlier charter. And of course, the administrative component of the rector of the guardians uh, became uh, more prominent, but also it established a link between professors and students through the system of election of courses, election of lecturers, and events of 1902 was logical continuation of the, of the evolution of the system. Another interesting aspect is that uh, when the disciplinary course were introduced uh, the, uh, on the same year, uh, student protests became uh, more, more common, and uh, these uh, so this uh, establishing the courts would either increase this student transgression or calm it, the situation down. And that, in my opinion, is a very interesting aspect of the uh, thesis where the author is successful. The thesis uh, is relevant because despite the fact that uh, modern universities do not have a similar structure, but uh, some interesting comparisons are made how it could be uh, interesting today. Also, I'd like to mention that, in my opinion, the work uh, in the thesis th contains an, an attempt of objective analysis because it demonstrates, on the one hand, an interesting attempt to create a quasi judicial body that uh, would have positive significance, uh, but uh, numerous quasi-judicial bodies in the Russian Empire weakened the very idea of unity of judicial power in the, in the broadest sense. Uh, the interesting facts, uh, startling facts, is that the disciplinary courts uh, always stopped functioning before next uh, revolutions uh, chronologically we may see a trend uh, before the first russian revolution and what happened before the before 1917 so in general i absolutely agree with the opinions of my colleagues that uh, without any doubt the thesis is a success it makes a contribution to the development of uh, history and judicial science. Also, I'd like to mention some questions or ask some questions and make, have some critical comments. First of all, in my opinion, it's too fragmented. The uh, much, much fragmentation of the methodological basis of the study here, uh, a, a wider spectrum of methods could be given, which were actually used. Secondly, uh, in my opinion, uh, the 
this certain contradiction is, uh, is no uh, a single line of arbiters of the traitors of the pre disciplinary courts as said by the author unlike judges were not civil servants but on the other hand no, knowing that uh, professors at universities had uh, uh, classes and ranks and wore uniforms, how the status of a civil servant and an independent arbitrator, there is no single line or single opinion on this in the thesis. A second point, not always uh, justified, is the use of uh, modern constitutions of foreign states uh, because of different uh, understanding of various uh, institutions of uh, state and constitutional law. Another aspect connected with Chapter 3, when the author starts talking about the disciplinary courts of Moscow and St. Petersburg University, the author has collected excellent material, but in my, my opinion, he should have done a more generalized conclusions and make better give better comparison of the results. And my final comment, uh, which uh, is tr true, is there are, are always mis misprints, uh, especially in the names. Leonid Alexeyevich Komarovsky uh, was, uh, so his uh, family name was misspelled. Um, these comments have no impact on their overall very positive impression of the thesis. In my opinion, the thesis corresponds to other requirements set by the order the 1st of September 2016 on the order of awarding academic degrees at St. Petersburg University. And the author, Suyaza Vyacheslav Valerievich, deserves awarding the degree of candidate of legal sciences. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, dear colleagues, I am glad to uh, welcome you on such an excellent occasion. I will not uh, go into mention the formal points uh, of the thesis. In my opinion, it corresponds to all the applicable requirements, and uh, I will only focus on some questions. First, when who enters a new path, uh, his, his progress is difficult, and to take up a theme that has not been studied previously by scientists, you need certain, one needs certain courage and has to be daring without the support of uh, of, uh, so I think uh, Vyacheslav Alarevich was succeeded here. Uh, not only he uh, constructed uh, a comprehensive picture of the activity of disciplinary courts, uh, which can be we can use now to discuss this issue, but in fact uh, he uh, unco he has uncovered this theme for the scientists, which is very interesting and very relevant because issues of conflict resolution in uh, the sphere of education are very relevant today. And uh, so we have to study our the historical experience in this sphere. As for the conclusions drawn by Vyacheslav Valerievich, which seem seemed very interesting to me. I would like to join my colleagues who have already spoken and add uh, a few points at which uh, I'd like to focus. I, it seems to me that the conclusion made by Vyacheslav Valerievich regarding the professor's courts as a step towards restoration of the university autonomy, or at least its uh, elements, is quite an original conclusion which uh, requires careful study and investigation. 
Uh, so that is very interesting. I would, I certainly agree that quasi-judicial bodies and the very issue of quasi-judicial bodies uh, has uh, been uh, pure, uh, very little, uh, very poorly studied. And as Vesislav Valerievich quite rightly uh, does in his thesis. In addition to that, characteristics of the legal status of professors' disciplinary courts that we saw for the first time is also interesting. And I certainly agree with Alexandra Andreevna. The study of uh, 1902 uh, fills in a, 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 a important gap in history. At the same time, when reading the thesis, I, just like my colleagues, I got various questions. Uh, I couldn't agree over certain points with the author, but the thesis is so interesting. And it has so many interesting possibilities that I will sh divide uh, my comments into two parts. I have some questions regarding uh, the mostly the theoretical approach and the second part is, uh, some stories that uh, did not get proper coverage and I understand that in a work like this it is impossible to cover everything of course so the first uh, point on which I'd like to be uh, the first point that I would like to discuss is the use of two categories uh, judicial or legal nature and legal status as it seems to me in some cases these two categories are uh, mixed together uh, in uh, one point it says of mixed legal nature and then he mentions mixed legal status or uh, dual binary legal status such is consistent inconsistency uh, such inconsistency seemed uh, unfortunate to me and uh, it affects the theoretical basis and as for the choice of the term of mixed legal status i think this category is excessive a legal status is legal status uh, we can characterize it with the help of certain elements components uh, but this and uh, we may say it has a mixed nature we have to define this combination this uh, the elements of the of the, of the status next uh, big part of the thesis is dedicated to comparing the disciplinary courts with uh, uh, courts of civil courts of the Russian Empire. So this analysis uh, is done on a high le has been performed on a high level, uh, but the choice of civil courts to demonstrate the nature of a professor's disciplinary court because professors' disciplinary courts and quasi-judicial, uh, the uh, part of the judicial system, and uh, quasi doesn't apply to them, the term quasi. Uh, on the other hand, s class specialized courts uh, which had separate status, they would be a uh, better object for this comparison. And in my opinion, in this regard, Vyacheslav Valerievich uh, missed the point. Next. In some cases, Vyacheslav Valerievich, as it seems to me, uh, was too categorical. Uh, for example, when he said that uh, a disciplinary court uh, 
immediately took the side of the prosecution. It seems to me that outside the context, uh, it can only show the active role of the court. And as for uh, the po possible additional uh, developments, of course, here uh, one gets many ideas. Some of the ideas have already, which have already been mentioned by Vyacheslav Valerievich, uh, and they can become subjects uh, for independent further studies. Uh, for me, for example, uh, I missed uh, better comparison of professors' disciplinary court, courts at the Russian universities uh, with similar international bodies. It will be very interesting to understand how this professor's disciplinary court, courts, uh, how, how much of German nature survived in them. So that will help us to get a better understanding of the Russian model of professor's disciplinary courts. Uh, it was possible to explore the uh, status of candidate judges, but these, in, in fact, these, in fact, are points that provoke thought for which we are very grateful to Vyacheslav Valeric. Uh, I would like to join my colleagues who commented on the excellent style and the use of archives, very careful use of archives, which Vyacheslav Valeric has displayed. And as I read this, as I was reading this thesis, I saw the theme. The author is very inter was very interested in the, his theme. Uh, you can always feel that. And I think that Vyacheslav Alderovich uh, is uh, uh, a real scientist and deserves a wording of the desired scientific academic degree. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana Vladimirovna. Uh, so I, I, it seems that it's my turn now. Uh, I shall not repeat what was already said by my colleagues. I agree. Uh, with my colleagues' opinions. This is a very good work. Uh, it's not uh, only about courts, it's about the university autonomy in general, which I have always advocated and uh, of which we have less and less, unfortunately. Now let me give you some considerations in this regard uh, regarding what I have read. The quasi uh, quasi courts. I don't like. So quasi means false, unreal. Uh, if uh, if we follow the meaning as so like uh, N uh, K V D courts were quasi courts. So why these? Why do you call these courts quasi? Uh, or so why is that unreal? So we have. Uh, the uh, so re maybe you know, uh, remember citizens' courts, uh, citizens' courts uh, who uh, took uh, uh, cases such as drinking. As for university courts, uh, Vyacheslav Valerievich uh, proposes several variants uh, uh, whose authority is uh, authority of the university cooperation. It is the answer is very simple. It's not the civil society, not of the state. Maybe I'm wrong, but then on the other hand, and it occurred to me, if these courts, which in the Russian uh, auto university autonomy, uh, they uh, were created with the noble idea to protect the students, why the professors uh, despise and neglected uh, so professor, why professors refused to take part in, as uh, it happens today, why students were so critical about the courts, why they didn't like. So this isn't that strange. Weren't they strange, those students? And also, I could not 
to the route. The courts were not established, says Vyacheslav Valerievich, to suppress political activities of the students. Why no? The first case of St. Petersburg Disciplinary Court was exactly a case against a student political activities. And then those cases were taken out of the, the disciplinary court jurisdiction. And then another point, uh, the public was similar in uh, Moscow University and St. Petersburg University. Then uh, why professors were much more disciplined? This is uh, not clear to me. Why Moscow courts uh, took up more cases is because of our mentality, Northern men Nordic men mentality. And about uh, justice, I shall not speak about justice because nobody can define justice. But I uh, liked the thesis very much. I learned a lot. And I think that we should reestablish such courts should be reestablished. Uh, we have a commission on this, uh, but I, it's uh, very uh, bulky. I forgot the exact name of this commission. It's a very, very bulky body. So the name I forgot. Uh, so it's uh, the name itself is very hard to pronounce. So the thesis is very interesting, and I am for avoiding. Uh, to Vyacheslav Valerievich, the degree of candidate of legal sciences, uh, specialty 12001. Uh, that's all I have, I have to say. Uh, Slava, the floor is yours. First of all, I'd like to thank all members of the Destination Council for careful study careful uh, uh, study of my thesis and I'd like to give the following explanations and I have grouped them in uh, by uh, topic uh, as uh, legal status of Professor Disney record I, uh, uh, the following comments were made regarding comment uh, Igor Yurevich of the term quasi uh, judicial the term quasi judicial was chosen for comparison as courts as bodies of state power which represent the state as a general arbitrator to resolve the legal disputes in the society this term is widely used in the practice of european court of human rights when there is a, a, a violation of article 6 of the european convention on human rights on the right to a fair trial in this case the court allows for an expansive interpretation recognizing this right in the case of proceed proceedings not only the constitutional judicial system of the state but also in other bodies that resolve legal conflicts in the society in this sense the term quasi judicial bodies doesn't have a negative connotation but shows similarities with the courts namely the general purpose and function fair resolution of legal conflicts with di differences in the order of formation and composition and as for the use of the term public courts i consider it to be one of the possible definitions but decided to aban abandon the term court within its definition although the connection with the society in this case is obvious next there's a comment by Svetlana Vladimna on concept of judicial and legal and mixed. Uh, as for the terms judicial and legal, I used these concepts as synonyms in my study, which is in harmony with the ideas that prevailed in the pre-revolutionary Russia. If we talk about the use of the word mixed uh, when defining legal nature of professor's disciplinary court, I try to emphasize its binary nature as much as possible. In fact, it has features of both court and quasi-judicial body, which leads to a mixture of these concepts. I agree that the term could be replaced by another, for example, dual, which would be a, a better general approach or to interpretation is preserved. As for Svetlana Dimas' comment on the terms of uh, decision, I agree this, this is used as additional confirmation of the fact that professor's disciplinary court was not built into the judicial system of the time, but at the same time used terminology corresponding to the criminal trial as an indicative, but not civil. Next, uh, Svetlana Vladimna also uh, mentioned uh, actions of professor's 
Court. Uh, I uh, agree with this remark. The, this was presented in order to show that the professor's court, as a rule, when receiving materials from the university administration, could play an active role, which is less typical uh, of an adversarial process, where the court of an arbitrator examines only the evidence presented by the parties. Next comment by Svetlana Vladimirovna. Uh, uh, article 17 of provisional rules. In my opinion, this uh, article is controversial as expulsion from university could have been followed before the proper assessment of them would be given by the court. But neither the university administration nor the uh, court of professors had the tools to determine for themselves the presence of a crime or misconduct. Uh, next uh, comment of Alexei Vyacheslavovich on uh, uh, the use of the term justice. As for the possibility of quasi-judicial justice, I in need, I'm in need considering two approaches. A narrow approach, justice is directly related to the state as an arbitrator, where the judicial system has monopoly for justice and uh, is, uh, extend, more ex extensive interpretation which I don't consider to be correct. Uh, I understand justice as activity of fair resolution of legal conflicts for the purpose of restoring violated rights, which is quite consistent with the activity of quasi-judicial bodies. If we talk about the professor's disciplinary court, I believe that its activity can be called justice when using an expansive interpretation of this term. Next uh, composition of professors' disciplinary and the judges' status. Svetlana Vladimirovna and Alexandra Andreevna made similar comments. Uh, the connection of the I'd like to say that this connection casts a certain shadow on their independence as representatives of the university corporation. Formally, public service is not directly connected with the status of a disciplinary court judge, but, for example, upon termination of service as a university professor, he also automatically lost his status of judge. Of course, psychological, organizational, legal nuances related to the status of a professor as a civil servant and judge need further analysis, including perhaps on the basis of Lev Yosef Petrozhitsky's conceptual ideas. Giving a professor the status of a judge did not mean expanding his public status and providing him with additional guarantees related to the status of a judge. I agree with Alexandra Andreevna that at this point it was necessary to formulate more clearly, namely to draw the reader's attention to the fact that members of the professor's court were civil servants solely because they were professors. Next, there's a comment by Svetlana Andreevna on uh, candidate ju judges. As for the status of candidates for judges, uh, it didn't need to be studied more thoroughly. It differed from the status of a judge in only one way. Candidates replaced those elected as judges from the letter for one re another reason were unable to conduct a trial. At the same time, if there were no such grounds, a candidate still remained the judicial staff until the end of the trial. As for Svetlana Larina's comment on the choice of, of justice of peace for comparison, it follows from the first article of the Institute of Judicial Regulation that justices of peace exercise judicial power along with other uh, state courts, and that they were closest to the population, just as the professors' courts were closest to university students. The choice for comparison was related to this and not to the corporate criterion. As for specialized courts of the time, such as commercial courts, they, according to Article 2, they uh, also uh, exercise judicial power, uh, but uh, in, uh, used as position was used as the criterion. In further research, given the diversity of the Russian Empire judicial authorities, I will use the Islandic advice and try to uh, comparison with the corporate and class courts she mentioned. Next, I will answer a remark of Alexei Vyacheslavich on the role of Lev Petrozhitsky and Pavel Ivanovich Novgorosov, the activities of professors' courts. Uh, there's no direct connection between their teachers and the activity of the courses in Petersburg and Moscow University. Uh, the archive materials and other sources I have studied never mention 
their opinion on the very existence of the professor's courts. Besides, they were a part of the court for a relatively short period. For example, Levi Osvich in total was judge only for one year and candidate for judge for three years. Pavel Vanch only one year was a judge and one year candidate for judge. Next, comments regarding questions uh, the, uh, about the activity of professor's disciplinary courts. As for Igor Yurich comment that professorship disciplinary court should have represented, first of all, the authority of the university as a corporation, I fully agree with it. But taking a, into account the special conditions of universities in the early 20th century where public authorities quite often interfered in the academic life, the internal university jurisdiction was also largely regulated by the Ministry of Public Education, which does not allow the professor uh, disciplinary court fully consider uh, the part of the university corporation. In addition, it is necessary to emphasize the fundamental difference in the legal status of pre-revolutionary professorship and uh, consequent of imperial universities in comparison with their modern counterparts due to the fact that professors were civil servants and had high class ranks. Next, there was a question by, from Igor Yurovich on the activity of professors' court uh, suppression of political activities of the students. Uh, I meant that suppressing political activities of the students was not the main goal of creating the court, was the result of a more general and important task. The fact is that Professor's Disciplinary Court was created as one of the elements of university autonomy, which, since the first European universities, meant, first of all, the existence of internal university jurisdiction. The very idea of creating a Professor's Disciplinary Court was discussed at the level of the Ministry of Public Education after the Emperor's opinion that they conservative and rigid policy at the end of the 19th century towards the students, young and immature minds only worsened the general situation and fired up the revolution mood among the universities. In this sense, creation of separate university structure to deal exclusively with student misconduct including political affairs, the guarantee that students would receive a sufficient set of procedural rights and guarantees. Whereas earlier, a university board could have expelled and sent to the army almost 200 students simply on the basis of suspicion of participation in the meeting, as it happened in Kiev in 1899, for which one of the acting ministers, National Duke Nikolai Pavlovich Bogalepov, was shot. Short. In this sense, establishment of professors' disciplinary court met the students' needs for greater guarantees during the proceedings, which could indirectly reduce their dissatisfaction. As for the questions of Igor Yurich Svaldelina or different degree of activity, levels of activities in Petersburg and Moscow universities, I explained this by uh, the Minister of Public Education's increased attention to the revolutionary unrest in St. Petersburg, where a significant part of protesters were students. Given that cases referred to Professor Smilly called by the rector, the number of cases at St. Petersburg University was lower than at Moscow University. It should be noted that at the initial stage, of the professor's court activity, both universities had organizational meetings and both prepared their proposals for the organization of the activity of these institutions. However, due to the large number of political oriented cases that were removed from the jurisdiction of the courts in 1903, the professor's court of St. Petersburg University had fewer sessions, although the total number of students who were charged was larger at St. Petersburg University. 208 against 158. This was mainly due to cases of ma mass gatherings in 1903. Thus, according to the binary quantitative index, Professor's Disciplinary Court uh, of Moscow University had uh, met more often, but its St. Petersburg counterpart worked harder, which is uh, connected with the greater uh, activity of student community in the northern capital. Then Ivan Vladimir asked a question uh, about the negative attitude and drawbacks in its organization. As for the question of the negative, about the negative attitude of many professors and students towards the disciplinary court, first, some professors negatively perceived 
the very duty to judge students as contradicting the role of a teacher or an educator who first lectures and then judges the same students for certain misconducts. Secondly, after the removal of political cases from the court in 1903, many perceived it as a diminution of the role of professors' court. Third, students negatively perceived any activities related to a possible prosecution which entailed, in particular, the refusal of some students to come to the sessions of the professor's court. But if we look at the statistics, out of 208 students at St. Petersburg University, 57 were acquitted. Uh, which is, that is more than a quarter. And in Moscow, out of 157, uh, 70 were acquitted, that's almost half of them. In general assessment of uh, Professor Disciplinary Court, as well as of many other phenomena of university life in pre-revolutionary Russia, inevitably affected by widespread opposition moods in the teaching corps and the students against, uh, towards the government policy. Bolshev, uh, and among the drawbacks of organizing the professor's disciplinary court, I could mention, first of all, existence of parallel jurisdiction of the rector, who could also impose such penalties, such as reprimand and admo uh, admonition, and soon began to deal with all the political cases, which in the early 20th century were the most, were the most significant. Finally, it was the rector who decided which cases to refer to the professor's court and which were not which also created an additional barrier. As for the reasons for cessation of the uh, court activities, from the archive it follows that already in 1917, both universities' courts did not consider any cases, though the judicial composition continued to be elected until 1916-1917 academic year. I haven't found a direct answer to this question, but it may be connected with the circumstances of World War I, marked by a significant change of mood in the educated part of the society, growth of uh, patriotism, some mitigation of administrative and poli police violence. Next, several comments about the modern uh, stage. As Alexander Ness comment uh, on the use of contemporary constitutions, I'd like to say that this was aimed at showing that at the state level, justice is not always identified with the activity of the courts. Certainly, these examples were taken from modern times, which did not necessarily correspond to the ideas of justice of the early 20th century. But on the basis of these examples, we show that even in modern conditions, there's no uh, uniform idea of justice. This is the comment by Alexey Vyacheslavich uh, on uh, contemporary institutions, and it's all the academic conflicts. Uh, the main problem is the lack of attention to them by the students, in particular, uh, directly provided by Article 45 of the federal law on education, the Russian Federation Commission on the settlement of uh, conflicts between members of the national relations is almost unknown uh, to university students. I applied to St. Petersburg University and Moscow University, and uh, in the first case, I found that since its inception in 2017, it received only one appeal and in violation of the order, which led to refusal to accept it for consideration. At Moscow University, I was told that there had been no cases uh, of uh, the commission being approached. As for the Commission on Ethics, their decisions are non-binding and cannot cause any significant consequences for uh, the parties. But at the same time, the existence of such commissions at the Pittsburgh University is known to many. At the time of preparation, uh, 52 proceedings were held. As for the question uh, from Irina Vladimirovna on the positive experience of professors' disciplinary court for regulation of contemporary education. Uh, no, uh, I see positive experience, the very idea of having a separate institution in the structure of modern university that would deal with conflicts between uh, students with sufficient authority and information support. At the first stage of its activity, the professors' disciplinary court showed its is, is the positive when each student was thoroughly examined in accordance with the procedure. While before that, the university board could expel students for dozens of reasons without sufficient grounds. And in conclusion, I'd like to discuss technical issues. 
is uh, I am sorry, I, uh, but I like, I'm happy they did not affect the results. I'd like to pub plan to publish a book, and I will take all the uh, comments in con uh, into consideration. So these are critical remarks of uh, members of the council to compare Professor Diffson's report with uh, foreign analogs, uh, give a d more detailed description. A third, make a third chapter strong, stronger uh, basis of the uh, on justice. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Vyacheslav Alevich. Dear council members, are you satisfied with the answers of the applicant? That's very well. Uh, does anyone want to speak? Is anyone willing to speak? Please introduce yourself. Uh, good afternoon. I am Ilin Fyodor Ilyich. Uh, maybe I come over here. I am a student of St. Petersburg uh, University. Second law is uh, a lawyer in criminal law and assistant uh, to the chairman of uh, Leningrad Region Military Court. So first, I would like to thank uh, for a very highly relevant topic uh, of this study, because first, I think uh, it's uh, highly relevant for the uh, modern Russian justice and for the educational system of our university and myself, I recently applied to the Ethics Commission of the university to settle an issue. Uh, in, and I'd like to say that the theme of uh, disciplinary courts at our university, because of that, I think will be, be uh, relevant will remain, stay relevant for a long time. And I think it's, this is very relevant. So I'd like to express my gratitude to our presenter. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> so why, no, you're not an officer. So this is the church. So we are, civil ser we are civil servants. We are not in the army. Uh, does anyone else want to speak? No? Uh, so, do we have any? Uh, we received any questions? No, we received no questions by email. Uh, that's very good. Then, uh, Andrei Vitalovich, as the academic advisor, you have the floor. So the key points uh, I have already included in my official review. So maybe in, a, in addition, I'd like to say a few words. First of all, on my behalf, uh, since the thesis is, uh, was produced by the degree applicant, of course, but uh, as being his academic advisor, I'd like to thank uh, the council members uh, for devoting their time and uh, their reviews prove they have studied the thesis very carefully. Uh, this is uh, uh, invaluable uh, so since professors are not uh, getting uh, due compensation for their work. As for the author, as for the degree applicant, uh, I have been thinking that out of dozens uh, uh, doctoral students, uh, only uh, uh, th three have reached the uh, finishing line and uh, so we, uh, some of you attended all uh, the previous defense sessions. 
But I think that today's thesis is something uh, I can be proud of as an academic advisor. The theme itself was selected uh, and it was very complex. Uh, if I understood it once, I would try to talk the author out of this theme because at the time he started his work, his first phase of the study, and that was in his master's thesis, only one single article on this theme has been published, written by a lawyer, but not uh, an expert on uh, history of law. And then we found one histori another historical article, and then uh, Vyacheslav Valerievich's articles uh, were published, and uh, other scientists became interested. Then we, but uh, today still, this uh, highly interesting uh, topic uh, has been discovered by the author of the thesis. He worked on it as a, as a master's student, and uh, so today he, uh, he said novelty of the topic uh, is not is, a, is not only an advantage, as was mentioned by members of the council. Uh, the reverse side was inevitable, factual, and methodological uh, drawbacks uh, and but uh, he, the whole life is uh, he has the whole his whole life ahead of him and since the, so he will he will work on these points in the future and I have been dreaming I'm dreaming of persuading Mislav Alinovich to publish a book on this uh, so then the bo book will be even more fundamental. As for the final point I'd like to make, uh, this work is very multi-sided. Uh, for the author, it was more important uh, the issue of judicial power, quasi-judicial uh, power and justice. And to me, since the beginning, it seemed the more, most interesting point, or my, m most most relevant point, uh, is a different side is a small fragment, but which is very important at the same time. As, as a, and that we have been uh, observing is the university, the university autonomy. Uh, professors and students before the two sides of the university cooperation uh, do not uh, deal with the issues themselves. Uh, since there are somebody from the ministry uh, who will come and give us advice and orders, then, uh, uh, of course, uh, there will be uh, no jump towards say, or scientific jump dash, uh, it will not happen. So, the, so if we want from uh, declaration to proceed to uh, real actions, so then we need, we must not only restore, but restore and reconstruct this university autonomy and such studies by step by step, they give us an idea what it should be like, so what, uh, what negative and what positive experience we have. And, and as for my own expression, even though it's uh, a little bit immodest, uh, when the work was ready, I had no doubt that uh, it's seldom, uh, it seldom happens that the author demonstrates at such an early stage that he deserves awarding the degree of candidate of legal sciences. Thank you. Dear members of the council, do we need a break for the, our discussion to discuss the results of uh, today's defense? No, we don't. 
Okay, then let's proceed to voting. Let's vote. Uh, okay, then let's follow the list. I have I have to uh, give your titles. Let us let's follow Dorska Alexandra Drevna, Doctor of Law, Professor, Head of the Department of General Theoretical Legal Disciplines, Deputy Director for Research of the Northwest Branch of the Russian State University of Justice. Uh, Alexandra Andreevna, I am for awarding the degree. Doctor of Law, Associate Professor, Professor of the Department of Theory uh, of uh, uh, Baltic Federal University. I am for awarding the degree. Timoshina Elena Vladimirovna, Doctor of Law, Associate Professor, Professor of the Department of Theory and History of State and Law of St. Petersburg University. Your opinion. I am for. Thank you. Doctor of Law, Vice Rector for Scientific and Methodological Work of Kharkov Management Personnel Institute, Ukraine. Stoba Alexey Vyacheslavich, your opinion. I am for. Thank you. And me, I myself, I'm also for awarding the degree. So what shall we do next? I have to inform you that Thus, out of five members, five voted for awarding the degree to Suyazovich Lavalirich, the degree of candidate of legal sciences, specialty 12001, theory and history of law and state, history of law and state theories. Uh, I congratulate you. If you would like to say something, yes, of course. I would like to express my gratitude to respected council members for careful study of my work, of my thesis. All your comments and remarks I will take into consideration in my future study studies. I'd like to thank the Department of uh, History of Law and State for their support for the opportunity to discuss uh, the, my scientific ideas in uh, such this intellectual community. And I'd like to thank my academic advisor, uh, the man who for many years together with me uh, is helping me, assisting me in uh, uh, my path uh, with his example. Andrei Vitalovich, thank you very much, and thank you very much. Uh, I think to ev I'd like to thank everybody who assisted me on this path to in writing this thesis. I appreciate your assistance, and I promise not to let you down in the future. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We congratulate you. I declare the session closed. Thank you all for your participation and uh, 